I'm a creature of hope. I, I eat it, I feed on it every morning. And the truth is, some days are harder than others, but there's these beautiful crystal diamond moments. Welcome back, everybody. Rich P. Baker, founder of Collector Responsibility, here today with another episode of the Sustainable Ambassador Podcast. This episode, I'm joined by the amazing founder of Regen Villages, James Ehrlich. He's a true visionary ambassador for sustainability. I came across his work, Regen Villages, really as a, as a new concept, a new design for how we can build resilience, how we can build community. So with that, James, thank you for joining the show. Welcome to the community. If you wouldn't mind starting us off with an introduction to yourself and the work of Regen Villages. Sure. So great to be here. Thank Thanks so much. Honored, really, to be here. Regen Villages is a Stanford University spinoff company. Main purview is to design and develop the infrastructure of self-reliant neighborhoods. What's the vision for change that you get up with every morning? There's something really powerful and special about an eco-village. It's about thriving abundance. It's about these communities that have the ability to provide for themselves in case of fill-in-the-blank anomaly. What are the anomalies you're worried about? And when they hit, what's the impact that you say is disastrous? I mean, for instance, you know, when Hurricane Sandy back in the East Coast in New York, especially where my family was, my family was without power for almost five weeks. And things get real, you know, after about day three. Candles burn out and you have your, your your access to your foodstuffs and your supplies start to dwindle. So yeah. all of a sudden, there's this stark realization that you, you can't really go on too much longer than about four or five days without some kind of intervention or struggle. So those are the kinds of things that we, we typically consider in terms of becoming sort of disastrous, because especially in an urban environment, the most reasonable people, if if they feel like they can't provide for their families, yeah. they will do whatever it takes to do that. Well, actually, you know, it's funny you say that because I'm sitting in Shanghai and one year ago, we were locked in our houses. About day three, day four, people started to send out the messages, hey, does anyone have, you know, we, we didn't prepare, whatever it may be, right? And you had a real range of activity. I would just counterbalance that by saying that what happened in our area was that the community really came together to help each other. So if you were in an area where you had a strong community and where people were willing to help, that's where that piece comes in to kind of pick it up when the government's probably trying to fix 18 different things that got wiped out by Sandy. Well, it's, it's also about infrastructure failure. So when you have a situation where if you're in a 40, 50 plus floor building and the power goes out, um, you have to walk to get wherever you're going up and down the stairs. Yep. Sao Paulo in Brazil uh, had a drought where people were given one bucket of water for the week. And they had to decide, should I make a cup of coffee? Should I do my laundry? Should I flush my toilet? So yeah. these are the kinds of climate-related anomalies, which even having a community of people in an urban area doesn't really solve for. So that layers in very nicely to my next question, which is, please provide an introduction to Regen Villages. What is it? What does it look like? What's the vision? Uh, Regen Villages is this concept to essentially create a modern industrialized version, if you don't mind that term, to an eco-village, a neighborhood that has this incredible regenerative, resilient infrastructure around those key components, clean water, renewable energy, high yield organic food production, and the connectivity to both uh, energy positive homes and smart mobility solutions. The bottom line is it's logical infrastructure that's there to work for you, not only in case of anomaly or emergency, but also to, to amp up flourishing and abundance. Naturally, you feel safer and secure. And yeah. everything then sort of contributes to, to longer, healthier, happier lives. That's yeah. really the goal for, for Regen Villages. But is this kind of the, the medicine that we need to avoid climate change? Or is this really a reaction to and hopefully ensuring resilience through? It's a great question. And, and I think, quite honestly, there's probably a lot of people who, who are watching this who've seen examples of one person or two people just planting trees in their backyard, in their area, in their village, in their community, whatever it is. They, they're doing something to, to try to sort of rejuvenate the, the ecosystem. And what happens is you start to see that there are microclimates that are re invigorated. And mm. so you start to get rains back where there, where there was drought. You start to get um, the kind of, of flora and fauna that starts to attract the, the wildlife. Next thing you know, uh, you have a uh, an improved uh, ecosystem and microclimate. Well, guess what? That is restorative. That's actually right. a repair mechanism. So it's more than just uh, like a life raft. It's mm -hmm. more like um, an oasis. 
we just feel like we're we're we've never been further disassociated from our natural world than we are right now. And we have we can see a pathway back. And this is one of the main pathways we feel is regen villages. Why and how? Because if we can start to really create these lily pads. I like to say, of um, organic, biodynamic, self-providing communities, there's a public goodwill radius that starts Mm -hmm. to get created. It's not just about those communities themselves, but they start to overproduce. Then all of a sudden, you start to have nation-state security because you have these lily pads that are overproducing. Plus, Mm -hmm. the environmental stimulus that we talked about before, the fact that there's a positive feedback loop and Mm -hmm. microclimates and and reawakening um, animal pathways and things like this. All of a sudden, we are reconnecting ourselves to the the nature and the world itself. When it comes to the OS, what have been the challenges to either building it or deploying it? And how have you learned? How have you adapted? What are some things that you did to, to, to overcome those challenges? We predicted. 10 years ago, plus now almost 12 years ago, that these things were coming. So it was not just about AI and machine learning and robotics, but also about systems and services that would have these APIs, these application program interfaces that we could talk to. 10, 12 years ago, didn't exist. Uh, But we knew it was coming, right? So you have to be a little predictive in your your thinking. Um, And so we cut our teeth over the last 10 years in what we could do, what we could study, what we could learn, what we could build, what we could design Mm -hmm. to inform and, and, and build the kind of repository or data lake of how the Village OS data model would get coded and then how we would then connect. We also predicted there would be an ecosystem of machine learning algorithms, and that's Mm. now beginning to really come to the fore as well. So um, I have complete confidence that everything that we've predicted is now really beginning to sort of um, be the right fertile soil for Mm -hmm. the seed of our village OS to really, uh, you know, come to fruition. We see that clearly. In terms of obstacles, how? Yeah, yeah. But like how how do you do you have like paying clients? Like how do you validate that idea? I mean, I, I get you on the vision, man. I really do. But like if you're if you're building 10 years to now and you're like it's gonna take another three, like you've you gotta have some data points along the way to like I'm at least in the right, you don't have to be in the exact right spot, but you're at least in the right neighborhood. How do you validate that you are kind of in the space that you need to be at the time that the solution's needed? Well, it's, of course, it's a great question, you know, and it's always that uh, little bit of that dart throwing in a dark room, yeah. you know, that entrepreneurs do, right? Yeah. And the truth of the matter is that um, we see this huge demand, uh, especially with landowners and real estate developers and communities who mm-hmm. would love to be able to leapfrog the process and see that, that the right kind of developments can get built and, and done quickly. Right. Right? right. And when you unlock that, the finance and the funding can come in. The stage is set for these things to to happen. And believe me, when we talk to any number of customers or you know, prospective customers or clients, they all say the same thing. If you can provide me with a tool, a platform that yeah. enables me to look at all the different land that I have in my portfolio, if you can do that for a couple thousand then uh, sign me up. You've had this vision for quite a while. I know you've announced a number of pilots. You know, wh- where are you in the organization, the infrastructure itself? You know, what are you, what are you looking at over the next five years to get accomplished? Uh, well, we have a lot on our plate, obviously. We are doing spatial plans and master plan work for a lot of different areas in, in around the world in terms of dealing with mm-hmm. landowners and some real estate developers um, and convincing some local regional governments that this is the right way forward. And at the same time, architecting and developing this Village OS software, which can do a lot of really interesting things. And that's mm-hmm. the goal, right? Is that it can ingest the rule books, local, yeah. regional, national, federal, and be able to suggest kind of a la Buckminster Fuller, you know, mm-hmm. a new layer of rules that um, that are, you know, able to accelerate the development and implementation of these kinds of communities that are necessary. What's your business model that I mean, honestly, someone's got to pay for all this, man. How, how do you build this in a way that they'll pay you for it because they're asking for it up front. So you have to do all that development work. Like how, how does this get done? There's a huge market opportunity. Um, there's probably globally in terms of real estate developers about 10 million. Um, okay. But then you've got the governments, you've got the communities, you've got the landowners. So there's a lot there. And then our goal really, again, is to try to actually funnel as we go forward to bring the costs and the prices down more and more and more and more to the point yeah 
where um, quite honestly, once our investors get their rate of return and they get their mm -hmm. terminal value from our perspective, you know, we're, we're, we're sort of eager to move to the open source completely. What are the conversations that you have with governments? I, I, I can see this as being a great platform for them to really start to stabilize their own challenges, but then also over time be able to use that as a way to even redeploy or find their own resources. So how are the conversations you're having with governments going and is that maybe a better market for you? Is that a bigger market for you? How, how do you view those conversations? The the topic of markets is, you know, somehow needs to be sort of bifurcated because what we're trying to do really is to say, especially to regional governments, which are typically the seat of power and dictate how uh, the local municipalities uh, can parse out land for yeah. development or retrofits or whatever it may be. Yeah. And and so we feel like the tool for regional and local governments is is really pivotal and, mm -hmm. and they're excited about it. They're looking forward to this uh, because they themselves don't have the financial resources to yeah. to to have architects and engineers and planners etc and they typically then rely on the real estate developers in a lot of ways to carry that that water for them um, so we feel like it is a an encouraging moment for them to be able to have access to this kind of powerful suite of tools absolutely in the, in the land of sustainable ambassadorship you are truly a visionary and in, in the way that you're presenting this and the hope that you have and the confidence that you have as well and I'm curious what do you view you your role as a visionary. You're not building it right now. You're, you're really bringing people in. What's the role of the visionary as they're out there speaking, as you're out there engaging people? Like, how important is that role? And, and what is what is the role of a visionary? To be perfectly honest, it's quite fractal from my perspective. In other words, it's mm -hmm. a sort of ever blooming, blossoming thought process. Yeah. Um, I didn't invent eco villages. I didn't invent, you know farm to table experiences. I didn't invent, you know, um, mm -hmm. I stand on the shoulders of a lot of great minds right. like Rudolf Steiner, Buckminster Fuller. And, and I'm part of this fractal that just is, is blossoming forward somehow this concept mm. that um, the next generations will be living in. And they can refer to these kinds of lovely informative um, videos and channels to be able to say, wow, you know, these folks were talking about stuff yeah. that, that now exists because that fractal was continued. So it's just, a, it's yeah. a long line of, of, of thinking really. What, I mean, whenever you're a visionary, it's never easy. Cause you had to first, you got to convince the world that they're wrong and you're right. Or what yeah, are my some dad, of the... my dad always said, you always know the pioneer because they're the ones with the arrows in their back. What are some of the biggest challenges you've had to realizing this dream and what keeps you going through difficult times? Well, uh, you can see the brick marks on my forehead, right? I mean, the bottom line is we know we suffer the slings and arrows and we, and we, and you persevere. I'm a serial entrepreneur, okay? So I've dealt with all kinds of stuff in my life. Mm. And I'm not saying it doesn't take little pieces, sometimes big pieces of flesh from you, and it because it does. Uh, but you know, you persevere. And the whole idea is it's not about me, right? It's about this mission that I'm a vessel for. Mm -hmm. And I'm interested in how we can improve the condition of living of not only just humanity, also species mm. on a flourishing planet Earth. You know, you you take the brunt of the friction in the market, in the ecosystem, in the community, in your peers. You know, that takes a lot of resilience personally. So I'm curious, where do you get that resilience? What keeps pushing you, you know, as, as that point through the friction itself to hopefully break through and open up the opportunity for others to follow behind you? My dad was a, a biophysicist and inventor with dozens of patents. Um, serial entrepreneur um, and and had you no know, successes and had failures. That is in my DNA, I guess. It just, you just pick up and you move on. Something bad happens. Wow, that, that wasn't so much fun, was it? And the key really for me is sense of humor. Mm. If you, if you can laugh about it, you kind of laugh and you cry and you laugh, whatever it is, but as yeah. you're laughing, it really breaks up the yuck. And then right. you you're able to <clears throat> to get perspective again. And then once in a while, just after a failure like that or something happens and some young person reaches out mm. to me and says, I'm so inspired right. by your work and I right. really want to do this and right. how can I help? Right. And I'm like, okay, I got to get back to it again. How do you measure success for your work and what you're building over there? And and how what keeps you going through these challenges to achieve success on whatever, whatever scale you're talking about? I, you know, I'm a creature of hope, okay? Mm. I, I eat it. I feed on it every morning. I have to like feel like I have this sort of uh, this sort of rainbow that I'm chasing after in a, to a certain extent. Mm. And and the truth is that some days are harder than others, of course. But yes. but there's these beautiful crystal 
diamond moments that happened. There was a local government that I had presented to a few months ago um, in a very beautiful place, and we weren't sure what the outcome was going to be. We just got the news that <clears throat> they decided that we can, can actually build a regen villages on this uh, landowner's land. And Great. And the landowner was ecstatic and we're ecstatic. And I hadn't really thought about what our impact was mm. in those in those government meetings because of yeah. several months had passed. To know that we actually are making a difference yeah. every single day. That's uh, that that's something, I think. It, not every failure is all pain. Like there's a lot of lessons out of it. So what are some of the lessons you've taken away and what would you share with someone 20 years younger than you? Everything that happens, whether it's good, or whether it's bad, ugly or indifferent, they're all just these milestones to learn yeah. from. That's it. You just keep going forward. And that's why a lot of people say that older entrepreneurs are are better suited because, <laughs> because we have a little bit of crocodile, a little alligator skin. And so that's it. We're, we're just tougher. James, thank you very much. That was phenomenal. Mm -hmm.